The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Technology. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. And joining me today on the panel are Victor Lambs. Hey, Victor. Hi, Dom. And Father Joseph Sund. Hey, Father. Good to see you guys again. Before we get into today's show, I want to tell the listeners about another show on the StarQuest Network they're sure to enjoy called The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows. That's where we talk about all kinds of movies and streaming shows, uh, more streaming shows than TV shows these days, like broadcast TV. Uh, but uh, we've got some great stuff coming up. We've got Secrets of Hawkeye, which is out the same day that this show is dropping. Uh, and that was a lot of fun to record. Uh, Secrets of the new Spider-Man movie. We've got Secrets of Apollo 13 coming up and april the oh but you have to listen to the secrets of the lost skeleton of cadavra that's coming out later this oh, month yeah <laughs> that w- was so much fun to record with jimmy aiken and david handlos and oh my gosh you've got to check it out it's it's um it's amazing uh yeah so uh that's the secrets of movies and tv shows which is available wherever you find fine podcasts or at sqpn.com slash secrets So before we get into our main topic, we have some listener feedback that uh, I want to share and uh, respond to. Uh, This one comes from Tom Grellinger via email who writes, uh, uh, in response to my pick of the week last week, he says, while I've not replaced our fourth generation Apple TV remotes, I did buy something very similar to Dom's pick in episode 150. I bought the AHA style protective case. And he has a link, and I'll put that link in the show notes. Uh, It not only makes the remotes less slippery with its anti-slip silicone cover, but I decided on these specific cases because they have a holder on the back where it could keep an Apple AirTag. Uh, I complained that that was the one thing that uh, the new Apple TV remotes don't have is they don't have that, you know, find it feature. Uh, And he says that we have a couple of uh, times, let's see, a couple of times we thought we permanently lost an Apple TV remote. I originally bought four AirTag shortly after they came out to put on keychains, but then bought four more and used three of those to put into our checked luggage on a recent vacation, which is a great idea. And another great tip, since we don't travel that often, I wanted to figure out another way for them to be useful when they sort of sitting in the closet most of the time and decided that these three could be used when we're not traveling to live within the silicone case uh, so that if an Apple TV remote goes missing, we pull out our phones, can find them much more easily. Uh, So, and he says, Dom mentioned wanting Apple TV remotes that would have the Apple UWB chip in it in order to be able to find them. I think it's an next, next best option. Easy for me to say. And uh, thank you, Tom. That is a great idea. I I love that idea. Um, you know, it, it's a little more expensive, I, I suppose. I mean, if Apple put a UWB chip in their remote, it would go up by 30 bucks anyways, probably. So yeah. <laughs> you'd lose that either way. But uh, they, They'd also need to sell you the $20 cleaning cloth for the remote. <laughs> well, yes, you have to keep that remote clean. With the twenty dollars cloth, yes. Speaking uh, speaking of expensive remotes, I've been using a Logitech Harmony remote, which yes. is a uh, kind of a Wi-Fi remote, but has infrared, so it can control all your all of your devices. It controls our Roku, our receiver, our Blu-ray player, and our TV. And uh, as someone who had bought into the Tile, which was kind of a one of those Bluetooth um, beacons before Apple perfected the technology with the AirTags, I actually had a, a Tile, you know, Bluetooth uh, transceiver, like. Uh, <laughs> Uh, electrical taped to our Logitech remote so I could find it, which is <laughs> kind of the inelegant version of this solution. So this is a this is a great idea coming from someone who uh, who uh, many years ago had had kind of struggled with the same thing. If you lose the one remote to roll them all, you are you are in fact powerless. <laughs> That's right. If someone's not bought into the um, Apple Sphere, um, I think Tile also does a sticker version. Yeah. Of their. Um, Yes. So if you're looking for remote control things and you don't want to duct tape it on, um, they make they make that sticker version of the tile. I think now that can be used. 
I have a Excellent. lot of tiles, and I've been transitioning some things to the air tags because one thing that the air tag does, a tile doesn't, is it does that direction finding and distance. Yes. All my kids' Kindles have uh, air tag stick uh, uh, tile stickers on them. So it's, when it was, by sticker, it means it has an adhesive back, and so it's it sticks to it pretty darn good. And so all of their Kindles have a sticker, and like it happens once a day at least that a child will come to me and says, "Daddy, can you ping my?" kindle because i've lost it in my bed and it's right where i left it and because <laughs> that's what i tell them i tell them it's, it's in your bed and we're going to walk yeah. right over it i'm going to ping it and it's going to ping no no i looked in my bed guess where it is it's yeah in it's in their bed through, through your amazon account i don't know if the new kindles have this but you used to be able to select remote alarm for specific kindles and it would make the kindle itself beep as long as it had battery power oh that's itself. Key. yeah and that, it goes, uh, that's the big one and then you get to play, uh, you know, hunt the Kindle in the house and look under all the couch cushions and, and find it as it's beeping uh, for, for two minutes. Oh, I didn't know. I have to look for that, see if that's still in there, because that was always my big complaint about Kindles. It's like, Amazon, put the thing, put the, the uh, beeping thing in it so I can find it. Yeah, I believe it's under content and devices in your Amazon account menu. Yeah. And um, there's one thing that's called find my Kindle. It's not that. It's remote alarm, or, or at least it used to be. Okay. I'm going to look at You know, on my... On my Dish network, this is low-tech stuff, but there's just simply a button on the receiver that says Find Remote, <laughs> yeah. which is so simple but so genius. So yes. there's just a little speaker on the remote, beeps for you until you pick it up, well, done. That's the great thing Like with the Apple Watch is if I flip up to the control center, there's a button there like a, on the control center with my phone and icon of my phone on it. All I do is tap that and my phone beeps, you know, and my wife does it all day long <laughs> because she's always using yeah. her phone. Uh, although it's it, uh, by default, it's right next to the uh, do not disturb button that which, yes. which I've hit in church and made my phone beep instead of go <laughs> silent, which is really annoying. <laughs> yeah. I have done that in church as well. <laughs> so yeah, now, now I have uh, the new, focus modes which uh automatically go on when i'm in ch in the church when i'm at the location uh so that's a great little uh second that's tip. more difficult when you live at that location though. well yes then you're you would just be in focus <laughs> mode all the time I, I get that i get that um all right well thanks tom that is a great pick and um i'm i'm that may be in my future at some point i, I like that uh the the air tag all right, so let's move to our uh, main topic, which is uh, something that's been in the news uh, recently. Uh, this, it had come out that the IRS was planning to set up a system where if you wanted to access your records, not this wasn't to file taxes, this had nothing to do with like, filing taxes, at least not at this point, but it was about if you wanted to access records, information on audit, and, you know, any, any individual personal information, you would have to set up an account using a facial recognition system. And it was, uh, well, I'll tell, we can talk a little bit about what, uh, what was involved in it. Um, there was a huge backlash be for various reasons, including the fact that they were using a third-party contractor who would be doing all the facial recognition and storing all the information. Uh, and eventually the IRS, there was so much fear, including from some members of Congress, that the IRS has dropped it altogether and said, we're going back to the drawing board. We'll figure something else out. And, oh, yeah, we've already paid them millions of dollars in a contract. So, you yeah. know, lucky for them. Uh, I want to get a government contract that gets dropped so I don't have to do anything for it. Yeah, the no, money. no bid is the way to go, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. No pesky competition. That's right. So yeah. a apparently the way the system was supposed to work, let me pull up the, uh, the information here, uh, you would uh, – to, you would have to create an account and you would um, have to record a video of your face using your computer or smartphone and send it to this private contractor, contractor called ID.me and they would compare it to a copy of your driver's license or a passport photo or something like that. And if it matched, which, you know, hopefully it did automatically, by the way, it, it's, it's automated, then you it would let you in it would say you, that's you if there was some kind of discrepancy you'd be shunted over to a live person who would have to you know verify that you're you yeah <laughs> yeah <Beavis>, yeah. please <laughs> like, yeah. Like, like a bad world war ii movie and uh so there's so many ways this can be wrong 
Yeah. I mean, I mean, where to start? I mean, yes, it's, it's a third party system. Yes. They're paying them that we're going to, we're going to pay them $86 million, you know, at least that they would disclose. No, we don't know who in Congress is on their, you know, board or, or a major, you know, <laughs> equity holder in the company. Right. Uh, no, we don't know the retention period on these videos. Um, you know, there was there was some question as, you know, this this ID me has, you know, many customers, each, you know, state unemployment agencies, things all collecting photos. And it didn't seem like they were setting up, you know, kind of like sandboxes or, you know, partitions for each of these customers. It seemed like they could compare photos across like their entire customer base, which is, I guess, 70 million people or something. Right. So, yeah, lots of lots of concerns with this. Um you know, I know, I know that other, you know, this is in the U.S., but I know that in Australia, they're doing a lot with like photo IDs. If you want to like, you know, leave your house, if you're under quarantine, that sort of thing, you have to take a picture of yourself wherever you go. But um, I think I think that, you know, to American, you know, audiences, this would seem kind of squicky, for lack of a better word. Well, yeah. And there are. Well, no, we've talked about it on, before on, on this podcast about well-known problems with facial recognition, with la lack of accuracy, especially among certain uh, uh, races and certain body types and that sort of thing. Um, now, this is doing a simpler one-to-one -one recognition instead of trying to you know, look at a crowd and match anonymous people. It, you, the person saying, I'm this person, compare me to their picture. So that's a, it's a, obviously a simpler thing. Another thing to keep in mind, by the way, is that ID.me has already like been doing this for you know uh, welfare and a bunch of other government services. So this isn't new. Uh, there are a lot of people who are already having to do this. This is just it's the IRS, which we you know every American taxpayer has to deal with. Yeah. Uh, and 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 it's the most popular government website. Uh, I, I put popular in square, scare yeah. quotes, most used. Let's put it that way. Yes. Uh, um, so popular in the same way that the DMV is popular. <laughs> exactly. We all have to go popular. Like, uh, yeah. Getting yeah. your, your teeth drilled by the dentist. <laughs> um, so one of the nice things about, to, about Congress today, there's very few things we can say that's nice about Congress today uh, or ever really, frankly, but there's a bipartisan agreement that, a suspicion of big tech <laughs> where it's across the aisle, like with Democrats and Republicans, when it's, when it's a, a tech thing like this, they are, they're all, we're, we're in on this together, uh, which is kind of nice. There's a few things that they're all uh, in agreement or many of them are in agreement on across the aisles. Uh, and there was a big backlash from Congress. There was, uh, uh, some of the objections, let me mention some of the objections. So some people were saying, um, Oh, we don't want the government to have all of our pictures on a in, on a file. Uh, to which I would respond, you know that they have all of our driver's licenses and passport photos, <laughs> yeah. right? Like they already have all that. So it's not so much that the government has our our pictures, um, but the the someone else would would defend this system, saying, "Well, look, it's just like using FaceTime on your phone, you know, you know or uh, Face ID. Sorry, Face ID on an iPhone or." the equivalent on a Android phone, that sort of thing. Of course, the difference there is those phones have a, well, A, it's my choice to whether to enable that, but B, yep. those phones have a secure enclave where that data resides, my image resides. And that's where all that comparison happens, not in some third-party cloud somewhere else. Yeah, it, it, it is the, the long-term storage of this that I'm concerned about, especially since the government has shown that they're perfectly okay with scooping up mass amounts of data and just sitting on it until they have a suspicion and then they can issue a warrant that's retroactive on that old data, even though they had no, you know, no justification for, you know, collecting that data at the time, they, they can still have issue a warrant on that back data. So right. your photo to the IRS or your video or something from, you know, five years ago could, could, uh, you know, could be subject to a warrant, you know, in, in, in the future. One of my concerns I have about this, and I'm looking through it, and I don't see when they had it in place, was there an opt-out, um, especially if you were elderly and, yeah, couldn't really handle the technology? 
there was an they were talking about an option to set up local offices where you could go in to do the verification. So I got a Polaroid <laughs> camera. I mean, let me just take a Polaroid and I'll send it to you. Be there in two weeks. I'll yeah. S- I'll send you an eight millimeter ta- tape of myself. Yeah. 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 This yeah. Is my, my grandma is holding up her laptop screen to her face. Do you see me? Yeah. Do you see me? <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it yeah, it, it just, it's a, I mean, I, I applaud the desire to advance the technology and to improve our personal information security. I like this idea that make it harder for people to steal our information by impersonating us. That's a good thing. And frankly, the, the current system uses passwords, which is a terrible system because people, yeah. Yeah, we all know, use terrible passwords and that it's just it's a it's fundamentally flawed. But. Uh, this is another case. We've been talking about this in several different areas recently of we're it's like we're pushing the we're, it's great to push the technology, but we're pushing it mainstream perhaps a little quicker than we should, perhaps. Yeah, um, it, especially since nobody is, you know, IDME is not letting people look under the hood and say, OK, how does this algorithm work? Right. Right. Part of my concern is the storage, the long term storage. But then what is this algorithm doing? Is it a any good and and b is it you know creating a lot of false positives or, or or what's the potential here and and if you can't let people's kind of you know if you have a government contract my personal point of view is that you should let people you know see what you're doing um in terms of the politics i think you can tell you know like you know people right and left arguing about this sort of thing take this technology and if you want to see if people are still committed to mm-hmm. privacy in this case or are still in favor of this technology apply it to something like voting, should you have to submit a video in order uh, to prove your identity in order to vote? I think <laughs> you you would see the the politics kind of the the people on either side of this issue kind of flip 180 <laughs> degrees on it in a, in a real hurry. But I mean, if if you need to do this to access your your tax information and stuff, I mean, you know, why not use it for voting at this point? Uh, I agree with you on the uh, on the the first point you made, especially which is that I think when it comes to government technology we should open source it as much as possible, whether it's voting technology or tax filing technology or anything like this, it should be available to, to for anyone to look at, to, to find the flaws, to, to, to suss out where the, the, the problems are. I mean, part of the reason they went with this new system is they used to do identity checks using credit agencies. But when mm-hmm. Equifax had its breach a couple of years ago and 148 million Americans information got out, they that's when they the IRS basically fired you know pulled the contract with them but it's like uh, did we learn nothing from that yeah <laughs> yeah i mean the only the only difference between that and like an id me breach is like when they choose to disclose that id me has already been breached right i mean <laughs> yeah, right right yeah yeah in in november of 2021 you have yeah and you get those email, you get those letters in the mail it says like you know 18 months ago your information was scooped up and we're, we're terribly sorry about that. Right. But good luck. Yeah. 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 Good Pretty luck. Much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here's your, here's your free account on our site to monitor your, your credit report or whatever. Yeah. And by the way, uh, in a month, we're going to yeah. start bugging you to upgrade to the better experience. <laughs> yeah. That happened to we me. We recommend with logging in twice a day to make sure you're super safe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, or pay 20 bucks a month and we'll take care of it for you. Yeah. Yeah. A little self I'm just there. thinking there was a bet inside the IRS of someone betting someone else that they couldn't make Americans hate them more than they already do. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of my that was kind of my like reaction. This is like players gonna play, haters gonna hate. You know, it's it's just like IRS gonna IRS and it just Well No, yeah don't yeah. I mean we expect this from you, but you know, be better than that. Well, and that's the thing is, it, maybe part of the backlash is because it's the IRS and people already kind of hate them. If it were, you know, the National Park Service, people might have objected a little bit. But, you know, it's Smokey the Bear. You know, we're not going to be too upset at him. You know, it's like it would, maybe it would have been it would have gone through and there would have been a little question. But there wouldn't have been the outrage uh, like this. I, I think part of it is uh, the IRS's own reputation precedes it. And uh, frankly, they're already overwhelmed. There's lots of talk about how they're overwhelmed this year already and uh, behind they're behind on their getting ready for the tax season and all that sort of stuff. So this just hiring, makes it worse. Yeah. Hiring 86,000 new employees or something or whatever the latest count was that they're they're adding yeah. this year. Something like that. Yeah. And like. 
that's larger than most corporations, you know. <laughs> right, right. right. That there are most manufacturing corporations even, but. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and it is a concern where you have, you know, basically agencies that were never thought of as having like police powers, like the U.S. Postal Service, you know, to conduct elections or the even the National Archives now, you know, doing raids on on private citizens to collect, you know, documents and stuff. It's it is a real concern with, you know, are we, you know, giving these so-called, you know, civilian agencies, you know, or, you know, increasing, increasing power to to police and collect data and stuff. So, right. I don't know. It's a, it is a concern for some folks. I think Congress is behind on this. Uh, I don't want to get, I don't like to get too much into politics on, on, on this, but. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. But I think Congress is behind the eight ball on government technology and privacy uh, regulations. They just have not kept up. They, frankly, I can't think of too many congressmen who I feel like are on the ball with this tech stuff. I'm just, remi- I'm just reminded of, and I'm not diving into politics too much, I hope, with this. Um, Ted Stevens' big, Ted the Stevens. internet being a series of tubes. Um, a series of tubes, yes. <laughs> and just being memed by just how ignorant of technology a right. large amount of Senate and the House seem to be. Um, and I mean, it's- it wasn't literally true but it was kind of metaphorically true you know you have <laughs> pipes and they're different sizes right and the yeah. pipes are kind of yeah but i mean that was that yeah. was a while ago but even like last year i think it was when they had the uh, the 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 big tech in for the hearings and the senator asking tim cook to, to troubleshoot his iphone like oh. <laughs> it was like dude and then they asked your um, apple genius <laughs> they asked Zuckerberg if he was going to shut down Finstagram. <laughs> right, right. It was like, no, that's not what that is. It, it, Finsta is a is a, a a word the kids are using. It was a whole thing. Yeah. So there is there's not a there's not a lot of knowledge on Capitol Hill. We we need and that's on us. We need to start electing people who are savvier about this sort of thing, and they need to start hiring aides and listening to them who are savvier about this sort of thing. Um, so. You know, that's it's all part of a part of a whole piece. I think the law that's still governing a lot of the Internet stuff is still the Telecommunication Act of what was that? Ninety five. The DMCA. Yeah. yeah digital. Millennial. Yeah. Yeah. There's been some modifications, of course, since then. But the but the, the general the law, the, the the overall framework is still. Yeah. The DMCA. Um, so, yeah, that. And, and we've seen, and that's what a lot of these hearings over the past year have been about. We've seen the limitations. It's just, it, it things cha- change so fast that a, that a 25 year old law needs to be updated. It's just, it doesn't cover what the way things are now. So, uh, definitely. yeah, I just don't know if we're, we're at a point where we can actually like update the law, you know, just given how fractious everything is, it's right. It's either going to go heavily one way or the other way, depending on who's yeah. in control of Congress. It it won't really be a you know truly a, you know bipartisan law. Now the uh, one of the things that that why this is such an important deal the uh, this question about the 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 uh, facial recognition using biometrics uh, w- with the security of the biometric data is you know if your password gets breached you you change it you get a new password but if you're if you're uh, Biometric data, like your fingerprint or your facial ID, gets breached. You can't get a new face. Well, not easily. I mean, not easily. No. <laughs> uh, or you know, new fingertips. That, that's that's all in James Bond territory, I suppose. But you know, it's uh, you, that this it is a gr- great concern when that sort of data gets breached and spoofed and taken over and gets out there uh, for people to use, and so. We, we need to be concerned about this. We've already seen at the highest level of American government biometric data um, get put into the wrong hands. Right. right? We, right. we saw yeah. that in Afghanistan, the, the biometric data they had. Yeah, that's true. Um, yes. On All the people who cooperated with, you helped American, yes, got the in American the wrong, military. Yes, got in the wrong hands. So yep. um, I think people had very good reason to be a little suspicious and a little weary of um, any of that. Yes, I yeah. agree. I, yeah. The, the government's very good at collecting data because uh, if they pass a law or something that says we need to collect this data, they get it, but they're maybe not the best at securing the data from bad actors. Securing and storing and access. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, just think of that giant warehouse at the end of Raiders of, Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's that's a government warehouse. Yeah. So, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. I, so, but the the bottom line is, is uh, for the moment, it's been shelved, and the IRS is going back to the drawing board to come up with something new. <clears throat> Lord knows what that'll be, but we'll just have to <laughs> wait and see. <laughs> so, all right, yeah. uh, let's move on from there. Uh, before we get to the rest of our headlines, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of technology, including Sean D., Ronald R., Luke P., Shannon L., and Father Eric T. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of technology and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So before we get to our first headline, I'm going off the agenda for just a sec to kind of mention something I heard about today is that it uh, looks like we're getting in, back into the uh, big hardware announcement, software announcement season. Uh, I heard that Apple is probably going to have an event at the beginning of March. I'm very looking forward to this because as longtime listeners know, I very much desire a silicon iMac in the 27 inch range to replace my long lost one. I've got a Mac mini now and it's okay, but it's got its issues. Frankly, I've I've had, it's had some weird problems like rebooting and crashing crash from wake issues and stuff like that. Uh, But I really would love to get a, uh, I love the iMac form factor. So, but also they're talking about um, uh, an uh, iPhone SE 5G and some other things like that. So, uh, and then other like other hardware sounds like it's coming along too from other manufacturers as well. So we're getting back into that season, and we should be talking about some of that uh, stuff soon. I have mine that I'm really excited about. What's your the um, Valve and the Steam Deck is on yes. schedule. Right, right. I I saw you. Uh, I think you're tweeting about that earlier today. Um, that looks I. It looks very interesting. It's one of those. It's the it's the impossible to obtain unobtainium uh, device of the of the moment, uh, where it's yeah. just like it, I think I heard people are actually selling copies on eBay and they don't even have they haven't even gotten an order in yet. They're selling. Copies. Yeah, that's what that's what I was sending a tweet out when I'm like eBay's doing nothing about this. Wow, and that's amazing. Um, yeah. As long as they get their eighteen um, percent or whatever it is, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. But um, Linus Sebastian on Linus Tech Tips was did a they um, released the embargo on the review copy that he had. Oh wow! And he he was showing the test speeds of the solid state drive versus just a micro SD, and the speeds were within seconds of each other. Oh wow! That's which amazing. is just impressive. That's great. Yeah, it's a, it's another you know handheld gaming device out there that uh, it, it rivals the consoles really. It's, it's the, we we I think we talked about it a, uh, a while ago on this show, um, just in its concept form. I can't wait to see what it's like out there. I I, I doubt I'll get one or <laughs> even give a chance yeah. to order one. I I still don't have a game console. And uh, I, I, by the way, when I mentioned that last time, uh, a very nice listener. Offered to send me uh, his family's old Nintendo Wii that his kids don't use anymore, and I really do appreciate. It. I want to say that like here on the yeah. show, I really appreciate it. But it would it would it would be wasted at this point for, for us. Uh, we our, our my my kids do iPad game time uh, screen time, and that's yeah. pretty much where we want to keep mm-hmm. them for now. But uh, I do appreciate that. Yeah, I think I think I'll stick with my Nintendo Switch. And when I say my Nintendo Switch, it's the one that, you know, the two younger kids <laughs> use. Everybody else in the house has their own Nintendo Switch at this point. But right. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, every, everybody loves the Switch. And yeah, compared to the latest Steam Deck or any other game console, you know, it may not be the highest power thing, but you could still play, you know, the game, the current games on it. No Man's Sky was just uh, announced right. for it. And um, a bunch of other, uh, you know, current games, but uh, it's a Nintendo console. You're, 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 you know, you have the Nintendo franchises there. They they put a lot into, you know, keeping those fresh, and um, it's just a really accessible, fun time. Yeah, it has an OLED display that rivals anything, though. It's yeah, yeah. I'm looking looking into upgrading to that one. Maybe I'll get my own Switch again <laughs> soon. Yeah, yeah. And the, the the downside is just like with the chip shortages, you just can't get these things. I mean, I would love yeah. 
the, when I was talking about consoles, I was I just I would love to get to, to go back to the days of flight sims and the Star mm-hmm. Wars Squadrons is the one that I kind of am, am you know uh, uh, jealous of not being able to play. Although t- in all fairness, if I had it, I don't know when I would have the time to. But Absolutely, I just would yeah. love to. But if I if I wanted a Sony PS5, I couldn't get one because it's just not available. So uh, that's that's the that's the downside for a lot of people. So it's, uh, it's good for me because it means I don't have to worry about not about missing out because I wouldn't have it anyway. Anyway, so moving on to the rest of our headlines. Uh, the first headline comes from uh, the IEEE, which is a, the International Electrical Engineering something something. I forget exactly what it is, but they're a very prestigious organization of, of engineers. And they have a magazine called Spectrum and they have an article with the headline, A Quadrillion Mainframes on Your Lap. And what the the article is sort of this historical look back at the mainframes of the past, the 1960s and uh, mostly the 1960s ones, the, the 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 computers that sent Apollo to the moon, shall we say? Yeah. And mm-hmm. we we often get these comparisons about how much more powerful our computers are than those computers of the early you know computer age. And what the author of this article, a uh, Rodney Brooks, says is. If anything, those comparisons grossly underestimate the difference in power. And uh, he mentions, like, I remember the, uh, a little of this from when I was in college in the 80s, when even, you know, even then the computers were much faster in the 60s, but nowhere near what we have today. When you worked on a mainframe, you had to get allotted time, yep. uh, compute time. You, you know, you got an hour time here share. to run your, your program or whatever. I mean, it just was so much... It was so much slower to to do things that there was a limited amount of time, and we would he the bottom line a week of computing time on a modern laptop. So if you you took a whole week to run a uh, some sort of model or simulation on a modern just a laptop, if you if you went back and ran it on an old IBM seventy ninety, it would take longer than the age of the universe by comparison. I mean that is. Yeah, hard to comprehend. A really good book if you want to get a feel for like what it was like working on these old or these early timeshare systems before you know multitasking was invented is uh, Hackers by uh, Stephen Levy. And oh, it's yeah. not hackers in the new sense as of people you know who who have you know bad intents. It's hackers was really people who cobbled together hardware in order to uh, you know, and it starts in the early days of the Tech Model Railroad at, at MIT and stuff. So. I can really recommend that book if you want to know like what these these early pioneers had to do just to get like a few minutes of computer time, you know, compiling everything on punch cards, running them through the system. There's an error, but their time's up. Come back tomorrow to to recompile your program and run it through again. Yep. Yeah, it was it was definitely a different time. And uh, uh, the book Hackers, uh, again, by Stephen Levy, really gives you a really good sense for for what that was like. I read a book a while back. It was um, The Man Who Invented the Computer. Um, the biography of John Atanasoff um, by Jane Smiley. And it kind of goes through a lot of that similar stuff of just those early days of computing um, and just fascinating stuff. Um, my own dad was at Mutual of Omaha back in the days of the mainframes and punch card operating <laughs> yeah. and all of that. <laughs> And he tells us stories about how, um, and this is computer history, it's kind of fun now, um, how we get the term debugger, right? Yeah. Is it was actually the people who would go up into the mainframes in these huge computers and clean literal bugs <laughs> right. off the tubes um, because that's what was happy, stopping the computer from functioning correctly. Yeah. And so the... Um, a debugger sitting through and being the guy who goes through lines and lines of code is not what the original debugger was. It was a janitor. Right. Um, and so yeah. the, the, just the history of that's yeah. amazing. Um, you, you mentioned vacuum tube, uh, tubes. I imagine in Brooklyn somewhere there's, there's some hipster who's like, no, I only run my, my Instagram account off of an old vacuum tube powered analog <laughs> computer or something <laughs> because of that warmth, you know? <laughs> There is a group of people, it's a subreddit group that only communicates on subreddit and Twitter 
using their tandies. Oh, <laughs> that's a dedication. Bless <laughs> yeah, bless their hearts. <laughs> they have to use the joke is though that they have to use a Raspberry Pi to be doing that. Yeah, so they're right. really not using their tandy. Right. You know, back in our uh, episode 100, we had a special episode there to celebrate our, our you know, 100th episode and we had every, everybody at the time on and uh, Pat Scott who told was talking about our, our very own Pat Scott. It was talking about her early days. She she goes back to these days with the early computers. I mean, she she was wow. one of the first computer programmers for the state of Texas uh, in their state government. She was in the secretarial pool, and then they asked for volunteers who wanted to go learn how to do computer stuff, and mm -hmm. she ended up going volunteering, and she first she started as a punch card operator. That's why they wanted secretaries, right, to, 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 to create all the punch cards, and then she eventually learned all the programming, and that's what she did. But uh, it's it. There's some fun stories from those days. I mean, I remember, my dad used to work for Raytheon, which is a tech company, and used to bring home uh, all these vacuum tubes, like they were just old vacuum tubes that yeah. were being thrown out and stuff. And it's just fascinating to see, and the fact that you know they were doing it with with this technology. I mean, they weren't they weren't necessarily you know modeling. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Victor holds up a vacuum tube. Uh, they they were they weren't necessarily modeling, you know, uh, nuclear explosions with these things, but they, like like they said, they, they this was the Apollo era. And in fact, they the some of the Apollo computations, orbital mechanics, were computed by human computers, by people doing. There was the that movie. Um, yeah. What was the movie name? Um, Apollo thirteen or no, no, it was about the the hidden, uh, hidden figures. Hidden figures, the African American women mm -hmm. who were the yeah. the the unknowns. Um, yeah, and, computer was a job. It wasn't a thing. It was a job. Yeah, that was yeah, your job was, title. Yeah. It was a person <laughs> who um, computed. Something and also like Jack Black's mom was a what like the actor Jack Black, his mom was a a, a a NASA computer who um Wow. She had to what was it? On the day he she went into labor with him, she was finishing the calculations for one of the uh moonshots or something. It's, it's like a viral thing. Oh wow. It? Yeah, it's kind of funny. That's anyway, cool. and Jack Black was in an Atari 2600 video for Pitfall when he was a kid. There's no, <laughs> no real connection way. there, but that's an, another early computer. So, yeah. you know, I have to I have to go sometime. It's been decades since I went, but the Boston Computer Museum is a lot of fun. Uh, I really ought to check that out again, take the kids and see some really yeah. old tech. <laughs> another um another fun book that's on um early coders mm -hmm. um is titled Code Girls. The Untold Story of the American Women Code Breakers of World War II. Oh, that's a good one. Um, and yeah. it's by Lisa Mundy. Uh-huh. And really good, just goes through, like, and it delves into, like, it does it in a really good story format, too. Yeah. So it's not just going through the boring details of it, but it's going through the stories of these ladies' lives, of being pulled away from teaching jobs and family life, and all of that um and being really the revolutionaries that understood what japan and nazi germany and all that were doing by breaking their codes wow um and they explain in detail the mechanical systems right. of the computers that were breaking the codes and it's fascinating yeah there's so a lot to check of that history. one out yeah, yeah. I, I think what we're finding here is that you know we're we're telling these stories and Yes, computers may be a quadrillion times faster, better, smarter, stronger than than they were, you know, back in the days of the mainframe. But something I think has also been been lost too. We have all this power at our fingertips, and and you know, what are we, what are we doing with it? Uh, sort of mm -hmm. thing, you know. Yeah. Um. You tend to you tend to value things more if it's scarce. Like if computer time is very scarce, you're gonna you're gonna treasure that a lot more. And now when you have the power of like fifty mainframes in your hand with your cell phone. I mean, what do you do with it? You just, you know, scroll social media and <laughs> make snarky comments. Doom scroll Twitter and uh, play Candy yeah, Crush. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, was exactly. it was a quadrillion mainframes that yes. are in your lap. Yes. Right. Oh, okay. Right. Yes. Well, and that's the yeah. thing they mentioned in the article is that the laptop is not even necessarily as, smart, as powerful as the latest smartphones, even with the GPUs yeah. and the, all the stuff Because you like got that. five GPUs running in your smartphone. <laughs> right, right. It's even more. But it's really the human story. That's really what's yeah. what's the the, well, the key in all of these is the the people and the 
people aren't any smarter today than they were then. The, the, it's just that they have better tools, but the people are the real interesting story. And uh, yeah, I, I, I recommend going to check out some of those, some of that history because there's some fascinating yeah. people. Yeah. Right. And your, your people who've built these today are standing on the shoulders of right. the giants that came before them. What they did for what we're doing with microprocessors now moving down to tiny nanometers wouldn't have ever been possible right. without those people who laid and paved the roads with huge computers that were just computing simple what is now a simple math problem right 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 so our next headline is uh this is a fun one i thought you guys might enjoy uh the pine phone pro is is coming out soon speaking of new hardware um, hold this... on one second here <laughs> oh <laughs> he there's the linux penguin he holds up his linux yeah. penguin this is the fastest Tux, right mainline linux smartphone on the market called the pine phone from pine 64 uh, the PinePhone Pro. It has 128 gigabytes of flash storage, a hexacore processor, four gigs of uh, RAM, um, a 13 megapixel camera. <laughs> um, it so yeah, it's gonna sure the the chip is basically equivalent to a Snapdragon from 2016. Okay, that's <laughs> fine. Um, it's not the most advanced, you know, tech out there. But it has a removable battery. I bet your phone doesn't have that. Uh, it and also hardware kill switches. And it has dip switches for turning off things like the modem and the microphone and the camera. That's big. That is, That's big. It's got pogo pins for attaching optional uh, accessories like a wireless charger or a fingerprint reader, a capacitor fingerprint reader, or even a keyboard case. The downside being that you can only attach one of those at a time. So you can pick and choose yeah. whether you want a fingerprint reader or a uh, wireless charging, but you know, this is not the phone for regular folks. This is the phone for a dedicated nerd who wants to really have a Linux phone. How cool is that? I'm not even willing to dive into this one. <laughs> so that's how, that's how off this one is, is if you're going to jump into this one, you're not going to have your banking apps. Nope. You're not going to have your um, being able to access your taxes on the IRS app, right? Or, <laughs> right I guess right. we got rid of that. Um, right, your your regular daily drivers. And to um, Pine64, the organization's credit, they are right up front saying that. If you're someone who needs specialty apps for your daily drivers, do not order this phone. Right. Yeah, and they're up front with that. I, I have to say, though, it looks a lot better than I was expecting. And it's like a second like project phone just to like, you know, knock around and treat like a mm -hmm. little mini tablet or something. I think it would be it would be kind of cool for that. I, I was uh, I remember back when I was, uh, you know, really getting into Raspberry Pis and stuff. You know, there, there were a number of Raspberry Pi phone projects where people had either 3D printed or or, <laughs> or just, you know, project enclosure cases. Uh -huh. And they, they looked like a brick that, you know, you could, you know, throw through a window or something. And this looks better than that. Definitely. So I, I definitely think, you know, you know, the original Pi phones going for one ninety nine, you know, if you if you wanted a, a fun project to work on, that's, you know, three ninety nine for the new one is a little pricey. but um, you know, it might be fun uh, if you're concerned about privacy. I mean, there are people who sell what they call like de-Googled phones. Um, uh, you could look at a there's a YouTube channel, Rob Braxman, <laughs> B-R-X, uh, B-R-A-X-M-A-N, who talks about, you know, privacy on phones and stuff. And if you want to go that route, it, but, uh, you know, this this I think would be kind of a fun, you know, second phone to use for projects and stuff right. like that. This is a second yeah. phone. They do have a lower model. Right. So this is a Pine Phone Pro. There is still the original Pine Phone, and they are still selling that one. Right. Um, and so if that, what is it, three hundred? This one is nine. Yeah, this one has an introductory. The the Pro has an introductory price of three ninety nine with a regular price of six hundred bucks. So four hundred bucks yeah, to six hundred bucks. Yeah. And I think the original is one ninety nine. Yeah. So if if you. Um, that one might be a little more fit to be a toy. Than, that's almost um, yeah. That's one fifty, and it's so that's that's in almost you know tech impulse purchase zone for some people, uh, mm -hmm. which yeah. It, I mean, if you, yeah, it could be a fun you know thing to 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 enjoy. So if you're a Linux guy, that would be the thing. 
Yeah. Plus, plus any product that has like goes full dad joke with a punny like name, like the pine phone, you know, <laughs> so the pine cone. It's yeah. You know, that, that gets my vote already. So <laughs> a, a fair warning about um, their products, though, is um, just in chip shortage stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think they're in full production on these, but I've been waiting. I'm just, I have a um, soldering iron coming from the Pine Foundation there, and um, it's been sitting in the harbor for weeks right now. Right. So, like, like a lot of the tech. Uh, yeah. So it's tech that's coming from China. It's built in China, assembled in China, comes across the ocean. And it's sitting in the harbors. Yeah. So if you're expecting an impulse buy on the next couple of weeks to get it, not happening. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. So uh, our uh, next headline is interesting. We mentioned actually Afghanistan earlier, and this one is also about Afghanistan. And it's about, so after America pulled out of Afghanistan and the Taliban took over, international sanctions dropped in on the on the country and that's created a humanitarian crisis where a lot of people uh can't get money to to get food and medical care um in in fact uh, they end up in 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 many cases because the banks are internationally isolated they're not there's no money available so a lot of these NGOs and charities are trying to help the people that they're connected with there to get them money, but you can't give them cash. The old way was, you know, either give them food, literal food, if you could get to them, or give them cash and let them get their own food. Well, they were having problems with that. So what happened with some of these uh, technology-focused NGOs, uh, including one that was teaching computer programming to young Afghan women, is that they've been sending them uh, cryptocurrency, various kinds hmm. uh, of stable coins. So a stable coin is tied to to a regular fiat currency like the US dollar so that it doesn't fluctuate like say Bitcoin and Ethereum do on a regular basis. Um, these are much more stable. And so what they do is they said so 88% of Afghans actually have a smartphone. So that, you know, people live in the city. They have their, they don't all, if you, if you watch too many movies and TV shows, you think all oh, Afghans live in, you know, mud huts in the country. That's not, that's not true. Um, you have a lot of people who are, urban and have access to things. And um, this is their computers, their smartphone. So 88% of Africans have uh, access to a smartphone. And so they have access to cryptocurrency. And so they'll, they send them crypto. They take that to a local exchange and exchange it for local currency, which is the Afghani, which that's their currency. And that way they can buy food and, you know, get medical care and that sort of thing. Well, the great thing about it is that means that they're Assets are no are liquid, which means they're portable. If they can leave the country, they they could take it with them. Uh, they it's not cash laying around where they can it can be stolen from them by, uh, you know, by bandits or whatnot or the Taliban. Um, so it's a very interesting story about how this tech is being used to help people in a real world situations. Um, I think it's fascinating. I like this. I like this. This. Yeah. It's clever. I did. It's a good use for crypto. It's not just a yeah. multi-level marketing scheme. Yeah. Like they're it, not selling them NFTs. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the, I'm wondering if these certain um, currencies are going to waive the fees for. Um, oh yeah. That's these a, particular. I mean, that would be a good outreach of them. Um, a very human thing to do, right? To not be making these fee money off of suffering people who just need the money. That's a good point. There are, there are, um, they, they call it different things, but there are fees usually for converting uh, uh, crypto from one thing to another, from uh, crypto to fiat or from one crypto to another, that sort of thing. So there's usually a fee involved to, be, to compensate the, the, the blockchain computer network, uh, it's complicated. <laughs> I don't want to get too much yeah. into the weeds on it. But there's a, usually a, a fee of some some amount involved. Uh, but it would be nice if they could waive that in particular cases. I'm not sure how you'd identify people for that, but uh, but it would be nice to be able to waive those fees. Yeah, somehow. I guess yeah. If, the, if the whole point of the crypto is that it's being anonymous... Right. Um, it makes yeah. it a little more difficult to waive the fees for that. That I didn't and think I, of that. That's right. 
And I guess if your choice is paying five to 10% to like, you know, Captain Crypto versus 50 to 80% to the Taliban, I'm going to probably choose, (laughs) you know. (laughs) Well, and the privacy aspect too, by the way, is, is another benefit of this is it's that because crypto is private, they can't track the, who's getting this money from overseas. That's not, it's just, it's a, it's, 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 there's no way for the Taliban to find out that these people are getting this money from, from them. Uh, So I applaud this. I'd like to see this used in other places too. Uh, there are lots of places in the world where you'd be surprised at how many, like the percentages of the population have smartphones. Yeah. But don't, because that's their only computer that they have access to. It's the inexpensive computer that they can get. And and so we talked a while ago about um, an experiment in Costa Rica in these towns where they were switching to you know, all the entire towns were switching to crypto. They were switching to Bitcoin mm-hmm. uh, and people were trading it because they had, they could do it because they get paid in Bitcoin. They could buy things in Bitcoin because they had uh, the phones to do it. And so I'd like to yeah. see more of that uh, charity. And I mean, I guess if you look at any like aid program, like USAID or anything, the money always goes to the, the group that can actually like, you know, just buy food, distribute food. And in many cases that's, the government or whatever that's partly at least responsible for creating the problem and this kind of like sidesteps that so this is mm-hmm. really cool like i can see maybe you know catholic charities they always uh you know promote like you know 90 95 of your contribution goes right to people in need we don't have to pay off you know uh, all these people and so maybe this is a model going forward for something like that eventually you know uh you know so right. catholic charities could look into at some point as long as they're not using GPUs to do it, I'm fine with it. <laughs> right. yeah. Stop using GPUs. Yeah, they don't need to mine the crypto. Just, you know, it, yeah. just trade the crypto. Trade the GPUs. Yes. So uh, that's actually a really good point, <laughs> by the way, about the the the, uh, the uh, corruption, which is that a lot of the, the charity has to deal with corruption. There's a certain amount of the, char- of the charitable funds that get siphoned off whether you know usually involuntarily charities don't want that to go to the to the corrupt guys but they don't have a choice it's got to go to them but if they if they can get it the funds directly to the people now there has to be food to buy that's sort of thing I mean fuel to yeah. buy and that's sort of that has to be has to be available to purchase but if that's the situation that would be that would be a, a better way to do things i think so i think one other aspect that i don't think we think about as much as Americans is the availability of banking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, the Afghan might ha- be able to carry around the cash, but how safe is it to be carrying around the cash? Um, right. In a hostile area. Right. And so the fact that they're somewhere safe to keep that money, um, that's right. obvious in Afghanistan. But then if we get into just regular third world, um, and even first world things of availability of banking and being able to bank um, when you're a poorer person um, and when you don't have that reputability to prove to a bank. Um, that's another benefit of this. And I'm not one that sees too much of benefits of crypto, but. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think this is a really good use case for it. And also there's a, uh... Like, you know, we have to remember that there has been an informal banking network called the Hawali Network, a Hawala Network, um, because uh, Islam forbids uh, getting uh, making money off of interest yeah. usury. Oh yeah, uh, the, an informal network of banking of, of a sort has grown up, and it's an international uh, system by which people put you know put money with a Hawala uh, in one place, and they. They market. It's almost like a physical blockchain, uh, where like a ledger. <laughs> they write your name in the ledger. You put so much in, and then someone can go to a different place and take it out. You know, on your account. Like it's it's an account. And but those systems are rife with corruption, with inefficiencies, with it's used by terrorists. And that all you know that there's all kinds of problems with that. Uh, it, it especially people getting taken advantage of. Whereas this, you know, again because it's the blockchain, because it's uh, open and you know, uh, it you know the whole internet is doing this. It's it's better. It's not perfect. Oh, you know, that's I think yeah. we've been clear on that. There's, there are there are issues or potential pitfalls in all of this. You know, one thing people 
the people who are receiving it have to be somewhat sophisticated to understand what crypto is and how to use it. They yeah. have to be able to read and write, you know? Uh, is, is there anybody like on the face of this planet who understands like <laughs> how this all works on the blockchain? I've Satoshi had, does. I like, Satoshi yeah, does. Yeah, <laughs> Satoshi does. I've had it explained to me like eight times. I gave an explanation to someone the other day using um, church baptismal registries as the example <laughs> for blockchain. And actually, it's probably the one of the best ways I've explained it yet. So in this proves the Catholic Church was the originators of the blockchain. But so um, you're baptized. I record your baptism in the baptismal registry of the church, right? Right. Um, you re you're confirmed at a different parish in a different state. Um, that parish has to send a notification to the church that you're baptized. So that can be notated next to the original record of your baptism. When you're married, the same thing, back to the original church. So this original record you have is always having a signature added to it every time it's changed. Right? So oh, if I okay. need to know something about you and your state in the Catholic Church, whether you're married and all of that, I can go back to the original record and see it. And that's very similar to how blockchain works. There's an organization called CatholicBlockchain.org that is trying to bring the blockchain tech to the church and get the church to use this more for various things, especially sacramental records would be great. Uh, <laughs> real estate records. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I'm, I mean, we all, you know, all of us have been involved with the church in one way or another, and we know how backwards the church yes. can be with, Ro with Rome just technology. got a telephone. Yes. Rome just yeah. got a telephone. So uh, yeah. I know lots of parishes still have fax machines, and that's how the, their primary communication from the diocese. So I, I get that. But I, I think it's I think it's a, a clever idea to kind of start thinking about this sort of stuff anyway, of, you know, how – because the church is a giant distributed organization, which is not – contrary to popular belief, is not centrally controlled. I mean, the Pope is the Pope, but each diocese is, is relatively independently run. You know, it, uh, there are, there's information that, that should or could be distributed. I don't know. I, I, I kind of like that yeah. idea. Anyway. You know, it's amazing to me still, though, for how ancient our system is, how easily I'm able to still get... Mm -hmm records and figure out who's been baptized and all of that just with um the network of churches working together um, sure right i had an individual who was um was entering into the church mm -hmm. at like 90 yep and we were able to figure out his baptism and everything even when he couldn't remember based oh, wow. on tiny bits of information so wow that's awesome all right, uh, so we should probably move on to our picks of the week. And Father Joseph, you're up first. What is your pick this week? My pick of the week is a um, iOS app, so for your iPhone, um, and it's called DNS Cloak. Um, and so um, DNS to short give a short explanation is the um, phone book for the internet, right? Yeah. So I type in Google.com. Um, DNS throws the record back that Google.com's IP address, right, which is kind of like their phone number is whatever, 68.12, right, so on and so forth, whatever it is. Um, and so there's services that put that back to you. Um, usually your ISP's DNS service, your, your internet provider's DNS service is very slow. Um, and your cell phone companies usually is too. Um, and also it's not the most privacy prone. Um, but the iPhone doesn't let you change that by default. Um, you're oh. kind of stuck with, on cellular, you're stuck on right. what the DNS is of your cell phone provider. On Wi-Fi, you can change it. Right. So this allows me to change it on cellular. It, um, it kind of creates a fake VPN network on your phone to allow you to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. don't want to go too far into the weeds with the pick, but yeah. Um, but one of the benefits I see of this is if you're a parent, it actually does have a password lock on it. 
And so you can go and you can choose like Cloudflare with the family controls mm. or clean browsing or different companies that have filtered um, and forced safe search and forced um, clean YouTube all set as defaults and lock their phone into that um, with mm -hmm. a password and parental controls, of course, set to not be allowed to delete apps and stuff. Um, and the app leads you how um, through how to do that on the app itself. So that's probably the most important thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is similar to a pick I had back in episode 65 called Next DNS at uh, nextdns.io. Hmm. It does the same thing. It sets up a, a proxy VPN to set up a, a DNS, uh, an alternate DNS server, although it doesn't let you pick from variety. Like you can't choose Cloudflare or Google or, or you know that sort of thing. You're using theirs, but it also provides parental controls, privacy stuff. It'll block ad networks. It'll... Uh, it has a deny list and an allow list and gives you some mm -hmm. analytics and stuff like that. So, and the nice thing with next DNS is I can set it up for all of my com computing devices, including my Macs, my PCs, everything. And it does Android too. Uh, so, oh, wow. so you can, so you can set up your preferences in one place and cover everything. So, uh, so that's another one too, but, uh, yeah, it, it's, it sounds it might sound complicated, but it's not, and uh, it's worthwhile. And both of them are free. I assume I assume yeah. DNS Cloak is free. Um, it's free, and it does everything for you. Um, yeah. I think there's a pro version that um, removes the ad from the bottom of the um, from their settings app. app. Yeah, but Which, the, but there's no ads forced on you outside of when you go and do the initial setups and the right. setting. So. And since you don't probably never going to go into the settings app you probably don't doesn't matter that's good that's good yeah excellent good pick very good uh victor what's your pick this week yeah so my pick is an app that you can download to your 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 computer phones there and uh it's an alternative to twitter called getter um it's spelled g-e-t-t-r as in you know getter done um <laughs> and it, it it launched in july of last year um as kind of an alternative to Twitter, uh, you know, people had noticed that, you know, certain, uh, you know, posts and stuff were being, you know, marked as misinformation or deleted and people were getting banned until they deleted posts and stuff. And so, um, you know, as a Twitter user, I found that personally very frustrating. Um, so I joined Getter personally in, uh, you know, when it launched in, in July of last year. And um, it's kind of like, you know, in Star Trek, they have a mirror universe. It's kind of a mirror universe version <laughs> of Twitter, if that makes any sense. But it's, yeah. you know, over the past uh, eight months, 10 months, uh, it's really gained a lot of steam as Twitter has become a little bit more restrictive. Um, people who are looking for a different kind of experience um, are, are exploring it. It's also, it, what interesting thing about it is its user base is, I think, like 40% not based in the U.S. So there's you know, a lot of people from Australia, Canada, Europe, um, all sorts of uh, China is, has a big presence. You know, people from China and Hong Kong and stuff have a big presence there because they can kind of, you know, share information that way. So it's I've used other things like, you know, Gab or Telegram, and they seem kind of, you know, not really sketchy, but it's a little too, <laughs> a little too, uh, you know, fringy uh, off the grid, <laughs> fringy for me. Yeah. And Getter has has really managed to strike that balance of, you know, um, you know, people, you know, sharing stuff um, and you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, you know, things popping up at your post saying, you know, this might be misinformation. It only make sure you're going to get approved source. Uh, we need to get I'm, I'm on uh, Getter. I'm at BetNet like I am everywhere oh, else. Oh, really? Yeah. B-E-T-T-N-E-T. -E -T -E -T. Um, I need we need more regular folk over there. I, regular uh, folks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because right now is a lot of political stuff and I just yeah. I, I can only take so much political you know, content, the, frankly. The, the memes are not good. Yeah, yeah. I, I would like to, to see more of just regular folk talking about regular things. Like, yeah, is what I liked Twitter for back in the day, you know? Um, so. I'm scrolling through and I'm looking at it and it's just like the explore trending thing is everything's political and i'm yeah. sitting there going i'm not too sure about that i, <laughs> well, I might not yeah. i might not need another political thing in my life <laughs> right right well that's i think it was what victor was saying it's like if we or i was saying is uh if we could get more regular folk in in these places because you know you know twitter is not the end-all be-all and frankly it, it, it bugs me sometimes 
but I also don't want to be doom scrolling through political posts yeah. all, all day. Now, Victor, when you're scrolling through it and you're going through your timeline, is it heavily algorithmed or is it just kind of as the flow of the things come through? I, I honestly can't tell, but if it's an, if, if it's algorithmed, I can't imagine what the algorithm is doing. I mean, it has to yeah. be, you know, kind of just, you know, whatever is, is popping up in the timeline and stuff. I mean, it, it has some cool features. Uh, there's live streams on it. Now they're adding short form video, uh, you know, later this, uh, I think this spring, but, yeah, so definitely it had kind of an influx when I think Joe Rogan had mentioned it. He hasn't really done much on the platform since then, you know, uh, had, you know, several million people joined uh, over a weekend or so, but um, or, you know, up to a million. But so, yeah, I think I think I would like to, as you mentioned, Don, see more of, you know, just normal entertainment type posts and stuff. It is it is a little political, but um it is kind of the Wild West, too, but not as not as fringy as some of those uh, other sites I mentioned. Right. Right. Very good. Yeah. Awesome. Good pick. So my pick this week is a little fun thing. So for, for ages, ever since uh, smartphones were around, you've been seeing these pop sockets, right? They're this little button that pops out, that attaches to the back of your phone, that pops out. It provides an extra bit of security for holding your phone especially when you've got a big phone and small hands like me uh gives you that extra bit of i'm holding my phone and i i'm not gonna it's not gonna slip out of my hand because it's slick as you know ice in my hand uh and now i've got an iphone 13 it's got the magsafe magnets on the back and so pop sockets has come out with a new pop grip for magsafe so it used to be you had to like a really you had to either get a, a mag a pop socket case so it was a whole case that went on your phone or you had to like use adhesive to stick it to the back of your phone which I just, yeah i don't want to do that because mm. uh, i don't always want it on the pop socket on the back of my phone because sometimes i want to put it you know in a stand or something like that and so but because it's magsafe then you have a new pop grip for magsafe k uh, uh, uh pop grip pop socket sorry all these pop things <laughs> that you can get um the pop grip for magsafe is 30 bucks so not cheap, but it's a nice little deal. And it's, uh, I got, the, I like it in black. I like it simple like that. And so it, they have different designs, but the cool thing is, is you can pop a, you can pop out the top of the pop thing. <laughs> I don't know what the terminology is. <laughs> and, no, that's turning into a Pringles commercial. Here. I know. I don't know what Once the, you I, pop, I, you can't stop. I, I should have pop. The fun don't stop. <laughs> I should have, um, I should have gotten my cl my terminology clarified before this. Go to the link; you'll see what I'm talking about. The the you can replace it with new custom uh, covers, and they have stuff for various properties because, of course, you know Disney and others need to get their their piece of the pie. And so you can get Marvel ones, you get Star Wars ones, and so I got the Grogu child with drinking from the cup one. Oh, it's upside down. I'm showing. I'm holding it up to the camera for the guys to see. Um, just it's his the bone broth. Yeah, he's drinking his bone broth out of his little cup, and it's the cutest thing ever. And it gives gives me delight every day when I see it. Like the kids see it, and they just go, "Oh, you know," it just makes them happy. So, uh, it, it's it's functional and it's fun and it's nice and I like it. But and if you don't have a Mac, you know, an iPhone with MagSafe, they have other, the other ones, the traditional ones as well too. So you can get. You can get those and you can get the Grogu for that as well. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's fun. All right. So I think that should do it for us this time. Uh, let me get back to my, uh, notes here. I was looking something up and I lost my, my ending notes, but, uh, I, okay. So as usual, <laughs> we'd love to hear from you. Just like we heard from Tom at the top of this episode, we want to hear from you. Any thoughts you had on our discussion at all, on anything we've talked about, you can comment on the show at sqpn.com slash technology or the SQPN Facebook page at facebook.com slash starquestmedia or send an email to technology at sqpn.com. You can find links from our discussion and our picks of the week in our show notes at sqpn.com. We would greatly appreciate it. We haven't had one in a while, but if you could write a review in Apple Podcasts or any one of the podcast directories, and Spotify now lets you do ratings of podcasts, by the way, you can share the podcast with your friends, and all that helps us grow our community of listeners, reach more folks, and that's what we're here to do. 
So until next time, Father Joseph Sun, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of technology. You're welcome. And Victor Lambs, thank you as well. Thanks, Don. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the Secrets of Technology on StarQuest. Quest.